In this tutorial, I'll discuss a medium security architecture that's very common in small businesses. This model features a zone called the DMZ. It takes its name from the war term demilitarized zone, where you have an area between two opposing factions. Here it's an area between an untrusted zone and a trusted zone. First, let's discuss why this area is necessary. In our example here, we have a public web server that's designed to be accessed by the general public through the internet. Plan. We also have the company's financial database server and the corporate PCs. The financial department uses the PCs to access financial records kept on the server. Because many software programs contain vulnerabilities, it's possible that a bug in the web server uh, web service software could cause a remote user to gain control of the web server. Once the web server is compromised, an attack on the corporate LAN can be launched from inside the LAN itself. This location makes it much easier to gain access to private information that's kept on the corporate servers and PCs. It may even happen that the web server has no vulnerabilities that can be exploited at the present time. However, as the operating system and web server applications are updated to provide new features, bugs can be introduced that will make the web server vulnerable in the future. This is almost impossible to guard against. A network architecture that incorporates a zone called the DMZ is designed to mitigate these risks. The DMZ sits between two firewalls which provide isolation and protection for the trusted LAN. The first firewall only allows in unsolicited traffic that's destined for the DMZ. The DMZ servers are not allowed to initiate connections anywhere. Now, this is a general goal, although in practice we will likely need to allow the DMZ servers to update their applications or operating system. And in some cases, a DMZ server may need to send messages to a LAN server. We'll see some of these exceptions later. A LAN to DMZ connection is allowed as often a PC in the LAN is used to manage the DMZ server. If we have a web server in the DMZ, a web administrator is often modifying the content of the site, and so we'll need to access the server. Ideally, the administrator would only connect from the WAN side to the server, but this is not always practical. The DMZ architecture uh, shown here is usually not implemented exactly with two firewalls. Usually we have a single security appliance that's shown in the next diagram. A single appliance, such as OpenSense, can provide firewall rules that create a DMZ. Technically, having two separate firewalls is a bit more secure, but this architecture meets most small business needs. The example here shows an actual working network for a community arena that has a box office and sells reserve seating for various events. The main components of the network are the Apache web server, shown here, through which people Patrons buy tickets online. A web listener, which is right here, acts as a go between between the Apache server and a database that keeps track of all the tickets to all the events. The online patron interacts only with the Apache web server and can select seats and purchase tickets by using their credit card. Notice the web servers in the DMZ. However, some ports must be open from the DMZ to the LAN, in this case to the web uh, listener. Some ports must also be open from the WAN to the LAN to allow uh, remote connection to the box office so uh, software. We do this for technical support um, by the ticket software company which resides in another province. A second network, shown here, provides a wireless connection so that tickets can be scanned when a patron enters the event. Allowing traffic from the internet into the DMZ can be accomplished in one of two ways. 
The first is using a service called port forwarding. Here we have three public servers for our company. Two are web servers, and one's an email server. The web servers both use port 80, and the email server uh, uses the SMTP port 25. Our company has only one public IP address. Port forwarding takes an incoming port request, right here, uh, the destination port in this frame is for port 80 using the WAN address, and it's forwarded internally to web server A. Now notice what happens though if we want to use port forwarding to get to web server B. We've already used port 80, so we have to choose to use another port. Here we've decided to make a rule that says forward port 8080 at the WAN IP to web server B. The only problem here is that people on the outside in the internet side here have to know if they want to attach to web server B, they have to use port 8080. How would you do this? Well, in the URL, if we had Acme, was the name of our company, we would specify the entire socket, and a socket's just a port and a, um, a fully qualified domain name, so we might access it this way. SMTP traffic on port 25 and using the WAN IP is directed to the email server at 192.168.10.7. Port forwarding works well for small businesses, and if you only have a single public IP address, it's the only way to allow WAN traffic into the DMZ. For those companies with multiple public IP addresses, a better option is to use one-to-one -one NAT. In our example here, our company has a number of IP addresses, 10501, 2, 3, and 4. With a one-to-one -one NAT, you provide a one-to-one -one relationship so that uh, traffic uh, that's destined for 10502 flows directly into the DMZ and only to web server A. 10.5.0.3 directly to web server and only web server uh, B. And what you'll notice here is that we don't have this port issue of having to use a new port. We can use port 80 here and port 80 here because the destinations have different IP addresses. SMTP traffic is bound for 10.5.0.4 and is direct lit, uh, directed uh, to the email server uh, directly across. The address 10.5.0.1 here is reserved for allowing remote management of either the security appliance uh, here or internal LAN machines or possibly and usually uh, some type of VPN connection. That's the best way uh, to get into your internal LAN. In the next series of tutorials, I'll show some typical uses of a DMZ using both port forwarding and one-to-one -one NAT functions.